This video is supported by Squarespace. Dr. Eben Alexander was a neurosurgeon who contracted a very aggressive bacterial infection that put him in a coma for seven days. When he awoke, he described traveling to another plane of existence and being led around by a spinning globe of light through a valley filled with waterfalls while being described the meaning of life and existence. Which he documented in his 2012 book, Proof of Heaven, A Neurologist's Journey Through the Afterlife, available on Amazon for $12.99. In February of 2006, Anita Murjani's organs began to fail due to end-stage Hodgkin's lymphoma. She described traveling outside of her body and hearing a conversation her husband was having with a doctor down the hall before being whisked away to another dimension where she experienced true love and pure peace and goodness all around her while being described the meaning of life. Miraculously, she recovered and went on to write a book about the experience called Dying to Be Me, available on Amazon for $9.99. Don Piper, a reverend in California, was struck by an 18-wheeler in 1989. He was pronounced dead at the scene, but 90 minutes later his pulse returned, and he described traveling to a shimmering gate and being surrounded by dead relatives that he hadn't seen in years, including his late grandfather. He describes his conversation with those dead old people in his New York Times bestseller 90 Minutes in Heaven, available on Amazon for $9.99. Or watch the movie version starring a mustachioed Anakin Skywalker? In 2003, three-year-old Colton Burpo underwent emergency surgery for a ruptured appendix. He woke up describing a conversation that he had with his late great-grandfather, whom he'd never met, and described riding on a rainbow-colored horse with Jesus. Book, movie, and entire ministry. Yeah. Some people have made a lot of money on near-death experiences, which makes it really easy to roll your eyes at the entire phenomenon. But today I'm going to try to do the hard thing and actually take these seriously. Because not everybody that has this experience tries to monetize it, and a lot of people have had this experience. 4 to 8% of the population, according to some studies, that's up to 14 million people in the U.S. alone. And as medical science progresses and more and more people are being brought back from the brink of death, this seems to be happening more than ever. So let's take a look into this phenomena and examine some of the explanations for why this happens, including one that you've probably never heard before. To many people, stories of near-death experiences just sound crazy and they automatically discount anybody who claims to have had one. But we all have crazy dreams all the time. Dreams are a very real phenomenon. You can't say that dreams don't exist just because they sound crazy. And that's all I'm trying to say here. You know, yes, there are people who try to make money and push their agendas using near-death experiences, and they do sound kind of crazy, but they do happen. A lot. So for this video, let's just take it at face value and examine what this could possibly be. Now, I know this dips into some metaphysical territory and some of you guys are not too comfortable with that. So for those of you who aren't, here's your woo-woo alarm. Now, one thing that separates NDEs from dreams is that dreams tend to be kind of all over the place, whereas near-death experiences tend to be strikingly similar. Some of the basic elements that tend to occur in NDEs include an out-of-body experience, traveling through a tunnel, seeing a bright light, interacting with spirits or deceased loved ones, a life review where your life is presented to you, feelings of peace and love, and the experience of having the meaning of life and the fundamental reality of existence explained to you. But according to a Belgian study in the journal Frontiers in Science, these characteristics might be prevalent in near-death experiences, but they are not always in that order. The order seems to be a bit more random. Now, it needs to be said that not everybody who gets pulled back from the brink of death experiences a near-death experience. In fact, only about 15% according to a Gallup poll. And there are also the unfortunate outliers whose experiences are anything but peaceful and serene. In about 1% of near-death experiences, they actually describe going to hell. Everything from fire pits to black voids to demons eating their flesh and, of course, speakers blaring Nickelback. For now, let's just stick with the classical uh, near-death experience and examine what could be causing this phenomenon. We're going to start from the most woo-woo to the least woo-woo and then go back a couple woo-woo steps. The first on our list is your soul goes to heaven. Occam's razor states that all things being equal, the simplest answer is usually the correct one. So is the simplest answer for the experience of somebody going to heaven just that people are going to heaven? I'm going to argue no, because all things are not equal in this case. Some of the other explanations on this list actually have some kind of scientific basis behind them, whereas the idea of actually going to heaven is only anecdotal in nature. I don't say that to completely discount anecdotal evidence, but when given the choice between experimental and anecdotal evidence, I'll pick the experimental every time. Now, having said that, there are plenty of things in science that we only have indirect evidence of, but we still believe. Uh, dark matter, dark energy, for example, we have indirect evidence of it, but we've never directly observed it. 
Many people will also make the argument that the belief in an afterlife has been a part of religions and cultures and civilizations all the way back to the very beginning of time, so maybe we shouldn't be so quick to dismiss that. The reply to that would be that the wrestling with our own mortality has of course led to a belief in the afterlife because it serves as a bit of a salve to take away that existential angst, and as I've talked about in previous videos, we are exceptionally good at lying to ourselves. So obviously, uh, this can go back and forth forever, I just felt like it should be included on here in the interest of being thorough, so there. Moving on. You're rejoining a universal consciousness. There are some that believe that at a fundamental level the universe is made up of and created by consciousness itself. Now, people use this to explain things like the double slit experiment and quantum entanglement, although experts would say that this is based more on misunderstandings of those things than actual reality. But in this worldview, consciousness is not something that's created by the brain, it's something that kind of flows through the brain. Now, the structure of our brains only makes up our sense of self and our experience of consciousness is filtered through that self that's created by the brain. So in this case, when you die, which really dying is yourself, and your experience of consciousness continues through the universal consciousness. Of course, in the case of a near-death experience, the body then becomes revived and your brain kind of boots back up along with the self that had just faded away. Now, it needs to be said that while this idea is rooted in more actual science, it is not in any way embraced by the scientific community. This is still kind of fringy stuff, but here's how it all fits together. Now, I've talked in the past about the Global Consciousness Project and how changes in human emotion can actually affect the patterns in random number generators, basically insinuating that our consciousness can affect the physical world. Which, of course, would tie into the idea that all matter and energy is tied into this underlying field of consciousness. Underlying fields, which one could argue sounds a lot like quantum field theory. Then there's the ORC OR model put out there by Stuart Hameroff and Roger Penrose, which argues that microtubules in the neurons of our brains could serve as sort of quantum qubits that could transmit information through quantum entanglement in and out of our brains. This could be the mechanism that allows our brains to communicate with that underlying universal consciousness. Now there's a whole lot of ifs for this to work, and it does kind of smell like we're patching in our holes in our understanding with quantum theory stuff that we also don't fully understand, which is why this is not completely embraced by the scientific community. So what is supported by the overall scientific community? It's all a hallucination caused by a flood of hormones and chemicals at the time of death. And now for the buzzkill. Now, as I mentioned earlier, there are several components to the classical near-death experience, and all of those can be described by different physical things that take place in the brain at the time of death. For example, people who experience carbon dioxide poisoning can often experience tunnel vision or seeing a blinding light. Obviously, when your heart starts pumping, carbon dioxide is not being pumped out of your brain, so it can build up, hence this effect. The whole life review and meeting of dead relatives is often explained by the fact that the memory center is one of the last places in the brain to shut down at the time of death. And out-of-body experiences can be created by manipulating the temporal parietal junction in the brain. This is actually a part of the brain that creates a sense of connectedness to the body. And then there's the DMT. Dimethyltryptamine is an endogenous psychedelic, meaning it's produced inside the body, and people who take DMT often experience feelings of love and connectedness to all of the universe. It sort of creates an artificial near-death experience. In fact, it's called the spirit molecule for that reason. It facilitates what they call ego death, meaning the self that I talked about earlier kind of goes away. In fact, it makes it a very powerful treatment for people who are terminally ill, helps them to kind of come to grips with their own death. So it was believed by many that at the time of death, the brain floods itself with DMT to sort of create this experience. But why? Now, some people suggest that the DMT is actually something of a chemical catalyst for spiritual detachment, that it's not just a hallucination, it's actually kind of opening a window to another dimension. Others say it's just nature's way of kind of smoothing the transition into death, a little something to take away the anxiety and help us to let go. Which is nice, but Again, why? Why would nature care at all that we are having a smooth transition into death, you know? Why would we evolve to do that? Evolution doesn't work that way, you know? Uh, a smoother transition into death does absolutely nothing to move our genes forward. It's useless in terms of evolution. And then if we have this ability and it wasn't put there by evolution, then why is it there? Or who put it there? Just this question alone gets pretty woo-woo in itself. Now, it could be argued that DMT and all these other hormones get released for the same reason that our bowels release when we die. Things just kind of let go. But the point is we don't know what that mechanism is or why it happens. But it just goes to show that even if you go to the most reductionist, physicalist explanation for NDEs, there's still a lot of unanswered questions around it. 
Now, there is another explanation for NDEs that I thought was interesting. It was pointed out by a Patreon supporter, and I had never thought of this before, so I thought I would include it here. It's called Technological Resurrection. There's a famous quote from Arthur C. Clarke that says that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. It's often called Clarke's Third Law. For example, I'm sure if you went back 300 years with an iPhone and showed them that you have this rectangle that can capture people's likenesses, that lights up from the inside, that if you press a combination of buttons you could literally talk to anybody in the whole world, they would probably burn you at the stake. Similarly, we easily accept that future people or a super intelligent AI will be able to do things that right now we can't even conceive of, things that we would consider to be magic. Things like curing any disease, recreating entire bodies, transferring consciousness, even time travel. None of that is beyond the realm of possibilities. What the idea of technological resurrection does is basically bring all of that together. The idea is in the future we might be able to transfer a person's consciousness out of their body in the moments just before death and put it into a physical avatar or maybe into a virtual world. That's an idea we've all heard many times before, but what if they could actually do that through time? They could actually manipulate time and go back and do that for dead relatives. Meaning the experience you have at the time of death is not passing into another realm, but transporting into the future. Now, some of this ties into a late 1800s philosophy called Russian Cosmism, which is facing a bit of a resurrection itself among Silicon Valley types. Cosmism was a blend of spirituality and technology centered on the idea of someday reviving our ancestors and traveling the cosmos. The movement was started by a Russian philosopher Nikolai Fedorov, who was also known as the Socrates of Moscow, and he also palled around with Leo Tolstoy and Konstantin Tchaikovsky, the father of Russian rocketry. Now, Fedorov and the Cosmism movement were the early precursors of the transhumanism movement that wants to merge humans and technology. This idea of immortality through technology is championed by some of the most respected thinkers in the world today, including Ray Kurzweil and Peter Thiel. They think that we're coming up on an, uh, a singularity where the artificial intelligence becomes exponential and completely transforms the human experience. And some of these transformations include the very types of technology that would need to be created for this kind of thing to happen. Now, it may take a couple hundred years, but given the current pace of technology, it's not completely out of the question. Now, you might be wondering, you know, in 200 years, why would somebody come back and, you know, resurrect me? Wouldn't they have forgotten all about me at that point? Which, yeah, they might have, but it's easy to imagine somebody wanting to resurrect their dead parents, and those dead parents would come back and might want to resurrect their parents who might want to resurrect their parents, and so on and so on. Now obviously there's still a ton of ifs and maybes for this thing to ever even be considered possible, but uh, you know, for one thing we've got to actually make the singularity, and then you know, we talk about the singularity in terms of utopias, but also nightmares, so not only does the singularity have to happen, but it has to happen in the right way. You know, in many ways this idea of a super intelligent AI eventually making the impossible possible is a bit of a substitute for what we've always considered to be God. It's basically putting faith in the future instead of faith in the spiritual. The actual projecting back in time, the whole teleportation problem whenever you talk about transferring consciousness, you know, these are, these are particularly hard problems to solve. But it's an interesting concept, so I thought I would put it out there for you guys. I'm putting a link in the description down below to a book called Technological Resurrection, A Thought Experiment by Jonathan Jones, and in it he breaks down this whole idea. He talks about all the little roadblocks that we would have to overcome and whatnot. It's really interesting. He sent me a copy. I really liked it. I think you'll like it too. By the way, this is not an affiliate link. I'm making no money off of this whatsoever. I'm just sharing it with you if you want to look further into this idea. Death is inevitable, and it's a bummer. So when you have a mysterious phenomenon that happens at the time of death, it's easy to want to put a lot of meaning onto it. It's easy to make it bigger than it might actually be. It's something that kind of gives us hope. Some refer to this as death denial, that we cling to ideas or beliefs that give us hope that there might be something after this, that this isn't just, you know, all there is. But it's important to remember that ultimately what you know to be true is that you have this one lifetime and you've got to make it count. Kevin Smith of uh, Silent Bob fame actually faced this himself earlier this year when he had a massive heart attack and was told that the procedure they needed to do on him only had a 20% chance of being successful. He spoke recently with Joe Rogan on his podcast about this whole experience and how, you know, what it was like to be in that moment and realize that this might be it, you know, this was the lifetime he was given. And how in that moment, all of his responsibilities sort of faded away and it gave him peace you know, a calm that he wasn't expecting. And I've heard this from other people who have been in a similar situation where they had to face their own mortality and the fact that their life might be over. And then once they get past that, uh, they just appreciate every day that they're given so much more. Every day that they wake up in the morning is a gift. 
I know that sounds like a cheesy sentiment, but I doubt there's anything cheesy about it to them. You know, we're all living on borrowed time. And I think the trick is to keep that from being an anchor that weighs you down and keeps you from being happy, but instead turn that into a sense of urgency that whatever it is you want to do, whoever it is you want to be, whatever you want to feel, do it now. It's literally the only chance you have. But I'm curious how many of you out there have actually been faced with the end of your life and lived to tell the tale? How did it change you? And did you have any kind of near-death experience? And whether you've had one or not, what do you think is the best explanation for this phenomena? I have a feeling the comment section is going to be really interesting in this video. Because if you have been changed by a peek into the great beyond, you should get that out there. You should share that enlightenment with people. Maybe even make a website with Squarespace. Why Squarespace? Because you've got a life to live, damn it. You don't have to spend your time reading up on CSS or Python or HTM, whatever the hell. Unless you're studying to be a coder, learning code is a good thing, kids stay in school. Make it easy on yourselves with professional looking templates, drag and drop designs, and world class support so even a total noob can look like you spent thousands on a total design nerd. And if you heard about people making money off of their NDEs and you want to get in on that action, Squarespace has e-commerce solutions to make that cash flow. Seriously though, I'm always telling people that they need to have some kind of side hustle, even if you've got a full-time job, if there's a product that you can sell, if there's a service you can provide, and that does not exist until you have a website. So get it up there, just get started, the sooner the better. And Squarespace has a special offer for viewers of this channel like you. If you want to get a free trial, you can go to squarespace.com slash Joe Scott. And if you want to continue beyond that, enter Joe Scott as a coupon code and you'll get 10% off the purchase of a domain or a website. If you've been thinking about building a website for whatever reason, stop thinking, start doing it. Go to squarespace.com slash Joe Scott. Links in the description. Thanks to Squarespace for being an awesome partner in this channel. And I want to give a special shout out to my answer files on Patreon who help keep the lights on or just creating an awesome community. I've got some people that I got to call out real quick. I'm going to destroy their names. We've got Lou, Dustin Little, Kirsten Fenn, uh, Kendall Sucks. I doubt that's true. Uh, Jason Bernardo, Bruised Nematic, uh, Philip Elmstrom, Sam Vint, Kevin Gandhi, uh, Sander Stoketh Skilshevik, yeah, nailed it, uh, and Sylvan Westby. Uh, thank you guys so much. If you would like to join them, get early access to videos, and just get access to me, because I can respond over there much better, uh, you can go to patreon.com slash answers with Joe. Please like and share this video if you liked it, and if this is your first time here, maybe check out this video. Google thinks you'll like that one too, and if you do, eh, maybe subscribe, because I come back with videos just like this every Monday and every Thursday. Also, shirts available at the store, answerswithjoe.com slash shirts. They make great Christmas gifts, just saying. All right, thanks again for watching. You guys go out now, have an eye-opening week, and I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.